Okay, welcome to Inside the War Room. I would bring on Ellen Wald as Dr. Energy. She is Dr. Energy, but today she's going to be Dr. History for us. Um, Ellen, for folks who, this is a different crowd maybe than our Energy, energy Week crowd, some lap, uh, overlap, but maybe kind of introduce yourself to folks who aren't familiar with you. Who are you? What do you do? And why are you the person we're bringing on to talk about the Middle East? Sure. Thanks for having me, Ryan. This is uh, one of my favorite things to talk about. So um, in my uh, alter ego as Dr. Energy, I uh, talk about energy and geopolitics and what's, what's going on with, uh, with energy every week with Ryan on the uh, Energy Week podcast. And I also write uh, for a variety of different uh, outlets about, I do energy analysis. Uh, we look at uh, oil prices, but we also look at emerging energy technologies and uh, geopolitics, especially uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the world's biggest energy producers. And uh, a little bit about my background. So I uh, come to this actually as a historian. I have a, a PhD in, uh, actually, believe it or not, in American history, but my specialty was always international relations and uh, in the Middle East and also um, basically uh, Western oil companies in the Middle East. And uh, that, that was uh, what I did my uh, dissertation on. And then after that, I actually taught Middle East history for several years. Um, I've taught uh, medieval Middle East. So, uh, you know, way back when the development of Islam and big empires and lots of, lots of big fighting and, and uh, religious wars. I've taught the modern Middle East, which is what we're going to look at today. Uh, and I've also taught uh, a class about Iran, uh, which is one of my kind of favorite niche subjects. Uh, and uh, last but not least, I have written a book about the Saudi energy industry called Saudi Inc., uh, which you should all check out because uh, it's scintillating. Okay. So if you look at a list of continents, the Middle East is not there. So, which makes it kind of interesting to, you know, if you're not a Middle East uh, expert like yourself, it kind of defined the boundaries of what the modern Middle East are, because uh, to be quite frank with you, if I were to guess, I'm going to guess I'm going to go too far or not far enough. You're not the only person who would would make that that uh, issue. And actually, the Middle East is one of these fuzzy concepts that you can kind of define as you want. And believe it or not, though, um, we can look a little bit into where the term Middle East actually originated. So the term Middle East wasn't actually the first thing that was used. Originally, they used the term Near East, and that was used until the end, basically, of the First World War. And the reason it was called the Near East, because uh, it was coined, basically, in the 19th century, uh, because, and as you might imagine, in the British Empire, because it was to distinguish that area from the Far East. So it was basically like the East that's not China and Japan. Uh, so that's how they got they got which this. Is, which is just weird for, for it's just kind of weird if you look at a map uh, where uh, Britain is and where it's kind of like the, the southeast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because now there's this trend to call uh, the to make the Middle East part of this new region they're calling the Global South, which I don't think mm -hmm. is all that more descriptive. But there is actually uh, an Arabic uh, term. So there, the term that um, that uh, existed for that region, there were basically two terms: the Maghreb and the Mashreb. The Maghreb is a term that refers to basically northern Africa, and it comes from the Arabic term land in the west. And so that covers uh, the countries of Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, Tunisia, Western Sahara. Then you have the Mashreb, which is what we would today call the Middle East, or comes from the Arabic term land in the east. So mm -hmm. I guess if you're kind of like standing in Egypt, then you have like mm -hmm. the land to the east and the land to the west. Mm -hmm. And so that in, that counts for basically uh, it, the area that goes from uh, like encompassing the Persian Gulf and the Suez Canal, the Arabian Peninsula, um, what was Mesopotamia, what uh, is also called the Persian Plateau. Now, that's, that's where we get into this fuzzy area. So that would be the areas of Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Some people do not consider Pakistan and Afghanistan part of the Middle East. They consider them more part, I guess, of Central Asia. Okay. So uh, basically, if you want to talk about Pakistan and Afghanistan as part of the Middle East, you can. But if you don't, 
you don't have to. Uh, and pretty, then it also say that like India would be a clear demarcation line where no one would consider India. Middle yeah, East. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then you also have an area that is often referred to as the Levant, which is basically Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, mm -hmm. and Israel. And then you have Egypt. Now, Egypt is technically on the African subcontinent, mm -hmm. but everyone forgets that and includes it as part of the the Middle East, not the North Africa part. Yeah. So let me yeah let me make sure I'm following here. So Egypt is uh, Libya and Sudan are not. Yes. Okay. And Correct. then um, Turkey is. So Turkey is considered part of the Middle East. Okay. Yes, but because that would be the a lot only... of. That'd yeah. be as far north in that direction you'd go, right? Yeah, that's as far north as you go. Anything, uh, anything above that is, and and no, it's interesting because Turkey itself probably would, at least for a while, did not want itself to be considered part of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. They wanted themselves to be considered part of Europe, right. and Turkey is definitely kind of um, between two two cultures in many then, respects. Okay, and then if we go kind of east, you got what I call the Stan brothers. You got all the all these <laughs> Stan countries. But if I'm understanding what you're saying, uh, Iran would be, um, so Turkmenistan would not be Middle East, right? Yeah. Um, Iran would, and, and then you go Afghanistan, Pakistan, or, or depending on how you take it, may or may not be. So really, uh, again, in, in India, so really you're, you're saying Iran would be maybe a kind of an Eastern border, um, Turkey kind of a Northern border, yeah. Egypt, a Western border, of course, then you have uh, Yemen and Oman. Uh, and then depending on who you talk to, Afghanistan or Pakistan might be the conversation, but Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, all those other ones, they're not in play here. Yeah. So one of the things, and so these questions are going to come from um, uh, ignorance, if you will. And so uh, for the listeners out there, we're just trying to ask questions that A, I have ignorance, but B, just people don't know. Is this formation of these countries, is it... Um, because of some kind of ethnic tie? Is it because of, you know, we think of the Middle East, think of oil? Is it uh, religion? Is it, is it just how things kind of shook out? Or why are we put lumping these countries? Because from Texas, you're sitting here you're going, well, what's the difference really between Egypt and Libya or uh, Afghanistan and Turkmenistan? Or, you know, why are these kind of the, the rough boundaries? And there might not be a good answer, but just curious if there is. So there's definitely a lot of, uh, I think what historians like to call it borderlands, um, kind of um, back and forth going on. So so you've definitely got these borderland countries where some elements you could argue are more similar to the Middle East, say maybe culturally or linguistically, but politically the, the state may have been more oriented, say, towards Russia than it was towards towards, you know, the big powers in the Middle East. But one of the things that has always affected uh, the way that the, the countries that became the Middle East are the fact that most of them were part of the Ottoman Empire at one time or another, uh, or were kind of surrounded by countries that were part of the Ottoman Empire. And really the modern Middle East came from the breakup of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. And I would say that's the main forming event of the the area that we know as the Middle East. And Ottoman Empire kind of walk us through just the high points formation, why it was broken up at that time. Uh, just, I'm not, I didn't go on for, I know you probably have hours of stuff, but uh, just for, uh, just at a yes. high level, just talk about the Ottoman Empire. Quick. Yeah. So uh, first of all, if listeners are interested in the Ottoman Empire as, as a unit, I highly recommend that you go on Netflix and watch the Turkish soap opera Magnificent Century, which will kind of transport you into the life of uh, the Ottoman Empire at, the, at, its, at its cultural and military height, which was uh, with Suleiman the Magnificent. And so the Ottoman Empire was formed in this area called Anatolia, which is basically the where what Turkey is today. That's kind of like the main area, and that 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 land mass is generally called Anatolia, and uh, it expanded out from there. Uh, basically, it um, reached its height after conquering Constantinople from the Byzantine Empire. So before the Ottoman Empire, you had well going way, way back, we had the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire kind of split into two. We had the Western and the Eastern Roman Empire. The East, the Western one kind of slowly 
disintegrated and fell into medieval Europe, but the western part, uh, sorry, but the eastern part became the Byzantine Empire. Which and would be where we get the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. Exactly. So we're talking about the Eastern Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And they were centered in um, the city of uh, Constantinople. Mm -hmm. And the Ottoman Empire formed basically east of that mm -hmm. and pushed uh, pushed westward, eventually conquering uh, Constantinople and renaming it Istanbul. So um, if you ever heard the They Might Be Giants song, it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. That's how you can remember that Constantinople used to be Istanbul. And r real quick, just for a time frame. So 1054, I believe, is when the um, the East Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church kind of had their formal split. It had been building for some time. Uh, I think 1054 was uh, the that year. When would be the the sacking of Constantinople yeah. and, and and that and um, how how much further yeah. down the road? Because we have uh, obviously the Protestant Revolution, uh, Protestant Revolution, and we have yeah. all these things that are happening. So kind of give us a little little. Uh, yeah. So so um, Mehmed the second conquered Constantinople from the Byzantines in 1453, and that's really when a lot of people mark the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, then the Ottoman Empire itself continued to spread from there both, it spread both westward all the way uh, to Vienna, you know, almost to Vienna. Um, basically they were stopped at, at the, the Danube, um, but they conquered all of the, what we know today as the Balkans and, and that whole region. But then it also expanded south and east. So conquering um, all of Iraq, basically up to Baghdad, and then all of Egypt, uh, parts of the Gulf, but really they, they never got into the interior of the Arabian Peninsula. They just really got all, along the sides. They had no interest in the interior of the Arabian Peninsula and uh, also uh, a large part of North Africa. And so the height really, I would say of the Ottoman Empire was in the, the late 1500s. Okay, and you might know this answer. I'm trying to look it up now. I can't remember, there was a gentleman from was it France or Europe who went down and kind of stopped the expansion into Europe from the Ottoman Empire? Does that, does that uh, or was kind of pivotal in one of the battles? Does that ring a bell from your your? Um, uh, I can't uh, remember the the name, but it was definitely one of the one of the French kings. The French I guys, think. yeah. I'm trying to think of who it was. I um, I'm sure it's on those. Anyways, I'm just trying to put some. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, there was there was a point at which. Um, the Ottoman expansion was basically halted and there was like a big, big battle and their, their expansion was, their expansion west was halted and then they kind of, the Ottoman Empire turned eastward. Now they weren't able to get into Iran, for example, because there was another empire there. So those empires kind of came up against each other and they fought a lot. Like the, um, there, there was a lot of fighting between, between the two. Eventually the Ottomans kind of came out on top. Uh, the problem that the Ottoman Empire had though was, so the Ottoman Empire lasted into the, um, you know, into the uh, 1900s. I mean, it was, this was a, a an empire, it had a, it was much more ancient than any of the European empires that were growing. And it had a lot of issues because of that. It didn't deal so well with industrialization. They had, um, a huge massive bureaucracy and in the 1500s their bureaucracy was actually a huge plus for them they had basically like a slave type bureaucracy they had these things called the janissary corps and janissary soldiers were basically people like men who were kidnapped most of them from areas that weren't muslim they were taken to um the ottoman empire they were converted to islam and they were extremely loyal. Um, some of them went into the military and some went into the bureaucracy and they were basically like totally loyal to the Sultan because they had no other connections. And that bureaucracy began to fall apart as these Janissaries stopped, you know, they married, they had kids, they had, you know, were susceptible to corruption. And so by the time we're, we're up into like the 1800s, mm -hmm. they're basically starting to crumble. And they used to call the Ottoman Empire the sick man of Europe. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And just, uh, just because I like to follow a little bit of China stuff, as you know, um, what, what was their kind of expansion or uh, how did they, they interact with you know, India and China and kind of the, the Far East, as we called them already? 
That's a great question. And I don't know a whole lot about how much they interacted. I'm sure that there was trade because there was, they were, um, of, uh, they really had a lot of, um, they were very seafaring. Um, you know, they had uh, a lot of, of there was a lot of interaction going on. I'm sure there was a lot of trade. Uh, I'm not sure what their, you know, formal relations were. Well, and the only and that's fine. the only reason I asked that is because um, you know I was looking at a book from Africa, and uh, I was looking at actually the first ship to set sail from the U.S. to China the other day, uh, the Empress of China. And just it's just funny when you you know we kind of think about you know what people would have known and just how much they know and how much they actually wanted to go and to talk and to, to trade and you kind of, the, the world is much smaller even back then than we like to think of it today. So it's, uh, it's, um, it's always, um, it's always interesting when you go back and kind of read some of these accounts like, Oh my goodness, like they, they were over well, here doing this and over here doing that. Well, one of the interesting things to remember is that, so um, there was a, a the Russo Japanese war. So the mm -hmm. Russians while both interacting in, in Europe were also big and interacting in, in Asia and it was, Theodore Roosevelt, who actually negotiated the treaty that ended the Russo-Japanese War, wow. uh, and so that's you know if you really want to think about the world being being circular, uh, it it very much is. Right, right, okay, all right. Well, let's. Um, so we have you go ahead. Yeah, let's get to the end of the Ottoman Empire. Yes, that's what I say. Yes, right. that's what I say. So, exactly. So interestingly enough, the 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 Ottoman Empire was basically this sick man of Europe. It was kind of crumbling. The Sultan wasn't able to control the empire very well. Um, they were experiencing economic and political decline. Things were not so great. Meanwhile, okay, we have this area called the Balkans. And funny enough, uh, World War I is basically said to have been, there, there were a series of conditions that were at play in Europe and, and Russia. And then there was this kind of powder keg in the Balkans and that started the whole thing. Uh, and so June 28th, 1914, a Serbian nationalist assassinated the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So the big, let's just kind of take a step back and think about what were the big empires? This was like the age of empire. So we have the Ottoman Empire, we have the Russian Empire, we have the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is also kind of crumbling. Uh, and then you have the British Empire, which is a different kind of empire because all of, it was really, you know, remember like the sun does never sets on the British Empire because they were, they were basically a, a, a seafaring empire. So all of their colonial holdings that were part of their empire, there was, they were not land contiguous to Britain. So you had to get on a ship and go to India and, and all this other, other places. And that really um, plays a huge role in why the Middle East looks the way it does today. And, um, and then you have the French had an empire and the Germans had an empire, but they, they were smaller. But those were kind of the big, big empires of the day. And um, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So he wasn't even the head of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was like the heir to the throne. He was assassinated. And that led through a variety of, of treaties, secret treaties, to Aust the Austro-Hungarian Empire's invasion of Serbia. And Serbia also had, uh, so there was basically the Russian Empire had said, if someone invades Serbia, we're going to consider it in, uh, an attack on Slavs everywhere. And John so Bolton would be Secretary of Defense back there or something. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, John Bolton probably loved, so there were basically two sets of, of alliances. You had something called the Triple uh, the triple Alliance, which was an alliance between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Later, Italy dropped out and they replaced it with the Ottoman Empire. And then you had the Triple Entente, which was an alliance between Great Britain, France, and Russia. And basically, if anyone of the Triple Alliance attacked anyone of the Triple Entente, everyone was going to have to go to war. Long story short. So Russia comes to the aid of the Serbs. Germany came to Austria's aid. They knew France would come to Russia's aid. So, the Ger so Germany then invaded France, which basically brought everyone into a big old war. And the question, so the Ottomans are sitting there and they're debating, what do we do? Should we use a war as a way to strike Russia? Because they had been fighting with Russia over territory for a while. And so um, and on August 2nd, the Ottomans made a secret alliance with Germany against Russia. So they decided to get in on the side of the Germans. 
and um, there were basically um, the Ottoman fleet attacked Russian ports on the Black Sea and entered the conflict. Now, interesting. The Ottomans mostly thought that the Russians were their big enemy. That's mm -hmm. why they got into this war on the side of the Germans, because they wanted a reason to get back at Russia. However, the British are sitting there, and they're looking at this, and they're, they've got their eye on the Ottoman Empire. They're basically looking for a reason to take stuff from the Ottomans. And this was their perspective, strategically, is they've got colonial holdings all over the world, and they primarily access them via the sea. And the most important access point for them is the Suez Canal, because that's how they get to the rest of their empire, especially India, which is the crown jewel. Now, in 1882, British actually occupied Egypt, basically to be able to control the Suez Canal. And when World War I started, they sent 3,000 troops wow. down to, to, to Egypt to guard the Suez Canal. So why were they so interested in the Middle East? Basically, there were five regions. One, they wanted a land bridge to India. So they wanted to increase their territorial holdings so that they wouldn't be dependent just on this Suez Canal. They also wanted to protect their water route to India. There was a lot of uh, what was called Christian restorationism going on in Britain as well. Uh, and so they had this idea that they wanted to bring Jerusalem under Christian rule again. It was currently under Ottoman rule. And oil. They wanted oil in Iraq. The magic um, three-letter word. The magic three-letter <laughs> word. So Winston Churchill, remember him, mm -hmm. uh, was actually the head of the Navy at mm -hmm. that time. And he had converted the British Navy over to oil, uh, which was seen as better than having it run on coal because, you know, they had to stop and, at these recoaling places and it was difficult. And he had changed it over to oil, mm -hmm. which made oil even more important for the British. Mm -hmm. And they had oil in Persia, but they really had their eyes set on these oil resources in Iraq. Then they also wanted to keep France out of the Middle East. So they thought, if we get ter ter territory, <laughs> then the French can't have it. Right. So those were their five strategic interests. And so essentially, they decided to make war on the Middle East and on the Ottoman Empire. Because that the fact that the Ottomans joined in on the side of the Germans gave the British an excuse to attack the Ottomans in the Middle East, yeah. which they did. Okay, it wasn't their primary pur purpose, but they did essentially attack. Um, they sent troops to Basra, and they attacked the Ottomans at Gallipoli in February of 1915. And the battle was a complete disaster. Winston Churchill was. A disaster at this. They lost. Uh, the Ottomans were under the command of a man named Mustafa Kemal, who later goes on to run Turkey. Um, and then they realized that the Ottoman Empire was not quite so weak as they thought, not going to fall apart as quickly, and they needed to find allies. And that's how we get to even more of, of where they found allies. So first they thought, let's try to defeat the Ottoman Empire from within. We need to find some allies among people who live in the Ottoman Empire but hate the Ottomans. And so they went and they, just, they said, who hates the Ottomans? The Arabs hate the Ottomans. So who amongst the Arabs can help us out? And basically and, and, they... And what was the, what was the uh, contention there between the Arab, Arab, uh, Arabs and Ottomans? Well, they just thought that the, the, the Arabs were like... Why did we have to listen to what these Turkish yeah. people say? Okay. And, and not all of them were, were anti-Turks, but they were always like, you know, we have to live under the yoke of these people and send right. them taxes. And, right. Right. Yeah. Right. So the British really didn't understand the Arabs. Uh, they thought they did because they had people in Egypt. Yeah. But Egypt was very different from Arabia, which is where they were really looking for. And there were two big leaders in Arabia at the time. One was a guy named... Sharif Hussein, who was the Sharif of Mecca, which was a very powerful tribal leader. He could trace his lineage back to the Prophet Muhammad. He had a lot of legitimacy because he controlled Mecca and Medina. Uh, and then the other guy was a man named Abdulaziz ibn Saud, who was hanging out in Central and Eastern Arabia. So there was this one guy who was in um, the Western part in Mecca and another guy who was in the Eastern part. And so the British sent a guy named T.E. Lawrence 
out to Arabia, to Mecca, to assess Sharif Hussein and see if he would be an ally. And uh, there was also, they had a British spy out in um, Eastern Arabia, hanging out with Abdul Aziz, uh, who told the British that he would be a really good bet to ally with, but the British didn't listen to him. They should have. So let me just because that will come back to bite them in the ass. <laughs> so let, me, let me hop in here just for just for yeah. a couple couple things I'm thinking of while you're going through all this. First off, the Suez Canal was finished in 1869. That is just insane if you think about that. Again, just what happened back then. Um, and it was like what they worked out like a decade or something like that. But anyways, um, the reason that I was asking about the the China deal earlier, and I went back and looked it up, was I was curious. Um, about uh, Genghis Khan. And so I went back and looked up the dates and it looked like he predated the Ottoman Empire. Um, so you have the, the, the Genghis Khan going through there. Of course, you have Alexander the Great that went through there. Uh, of course, the Egyptians have been in a powerhouse and, you know, for, for, for the go back in time. It's just, we think of kind of, um, it, you know, imperialism, you know, it kind of what's happened in Europe because of World War One, World War Two, kind of where we're getting at. But, but this area historically has just been conquered and reconquered and turned over and turned over by different armies from different places. And of course, you've got the Crusades and all, all these things. It's just, it's just fascinating just to kind of think about that. Um, but one of the things, um, and you might be getting to this, um, is some of those older empires didn't really go, it looks like from the historical maps, go after Saudi Arabia. Uh, they, they went kind of north and they went around. Is there any any significance why Saudi Arabia was uh, ignored for so long? So actually, um, if you go back to like pre-Islamic, the pre-Islamic era, um, Saudi Arabia was basically ignored because it was desert and no one wanted to try to traipse through it. Um, but um, pre-Islam, so you had the, the big empires were the Byzantines and the Sasanians. Mm -hmm. And the Sasanians were basically like a Persian kind of Central Asian empire. And the Byzantines were the same Byzantines that we talked about. And they were constantly at war, basically on and off wars the whole time. And one of the reasons that Arabia actually became more prominent during that time was because trade the primary way that, that people traded in the region had been using sea routes. But mm -hmm. because the Byzantines and the Sasanians were fighting a lot actually at sea, people started, it was too dangerous for say trader, you know, traders. And so they started to use Arabia as uh, an alternative to, um, you know, to taking their, their cargo by sea. And that's actually how um, the area on um, the, the western part of Arabia, Mecca, Medina, that area grew in, in wealth uh, at that time, in this, this pre-Islamic time, because there were more caravans who were coming up through there, like they were coming from China and then going kind of through there, or they were end up come, going uh, all the way to, to Damascus. Uh, so people were, were using that, and they say that that Muhammad was actually a uh, caravan. You know, he he had he led caravans, uh, you know, through the region, and that was his primary way of, of you know his livelihood at the time. And so um, Arabia was, actually grew in economic importance um, before it became a religious center, and then you had the development of Islam and then you had the Islamic empires that actually came from Arabia out and conquered areas that the Byzantine empire had trouble holding on to and areas that the Sasanian empire had trouble holding on to. So you basically had a power vacuum mm -hmm. in the middle there, including in Arabia. And when Islam developed, it, it didn't, it wasn't just a religion, but it was also like, many religions at the time it also was you know an empire became an empire and they managed to get control over a lot of this this area bet basically between the byzantines and the sasanians uh so it was essentially like like a power vacuum that they took advantage of okay yep sorry i didn't mean to go back too much no that was great that was a great question at, yeah, looking through the map yeah. like, it's, it's really yeah. cool. it's out there okay yeah. so we have the ottoman empire we have world war one obviously one. through um, and, 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 you know, again, today it's kind of hard to think about, uh, the importance of ships, but, you know, you talk about months going around and the food and the ability just to do that. It, it was, uh, critical. Um, I, I think the prize, uh, Jurgen's book talks about Churchill going to the, the oil based fleet, yeah. right book that has some, that he kind of was kind of the first one to kind of cut, well, I say first one, yeah. one of the more in-depth books that covers that. Um, and so, um, 
so you kind of so we have World War One, and obviously that's a lesser studied topic in history. But so the Empire <laughs> you said is kind of going to crumble, fall apart as World War One yeah. ends. Is that tied with the Treaty of Versailles, or is it just kind of unrelated to? So first, so it is tied, but but before we get there, the British make three very important deals during World War One. And they, the, the first deal is they make this deal with this guy, Hussein, in Mecca. And basically they say, we'll support some sort of Arab independence if you help us make a revolt in the Middle East against the Ottomans. And uh, so that was, that was a big one. Then the second one was the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which uh, was actually the Sykes-Picot-Sazanov Agreement because it was a secret treaty between the British, the French, and the Russians. And they essentially divided up the Middle East. And they said, you know, basically France, if you support us, then you can control part of the Middle East. You'll get basically Syria and Lebanon and the, which didn't exist at the time. So they had a map and they actually drew these lines. They'll say, you can have this area for your influence. And the British wanted uh, basically Iraq and what's net today, Iraq and Jordan and Egypt. And the French wanted like, uh, sorry, the, the Russians wanted some other stuff, but that um, became totally null and void when the Russians had a revolution and overthrew the czar and basically every international agreement they made was, uh, um, and, but actually the Bolsheviks were the ones who publicized this agreement to the world because they found it in the archives and printed it. And it was like, oh, you evil British and French, you're trying to divide up the Middle East, which they were. And it decided to say that the, uh, that the area called Palestine would be an international zone. And then the last agreement, was the Balfour Declaration, which doesn't totally make sense in comparison with the other agreements, but basically said that it would view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for Jewish people. And part of the reason that they did this was because they had already agreed with the French that Palestine would be international, but they wanted to secure British influence there. And they thought that if they did that, then British people would move there and they would like the British more. So that was part of it. There were, there were other reasons. But anyway, so um, then we get this big Arab revolt. And that's basically, if you can get through the whole movie of Lawrence of Arabia, that's what that's about. They blew up train line, they blew up railways, and eventually, so Hussein, wasn't able to create a full-scale revolt, but he did raise two armies. He had three sons, and he sent two of his sons with men with the British, and one of them went north, and they attacked um, Ottoman positions in Syria, and then came went down into Palestine. The other one went south, and came up kind of through the, the southern part, and they were successful, and they marched into Jerusalem and captured it. So, the war then ends. Uh, the Ottomans end up suing for peace in uh, 1918. In all, the British had to send two million men to fight the Ottomans. So they finally they, they finally defeat beat the Ottomans. And the British here's the reason that the one of the other reasons that the Middle East looks the way it does. The British had troops on the ground in the Middle East. They had. Um, men in Baghdad, men in Mosul, they controlled the Dardanelles, and um, they were closing in on Istanbul. And they, they had their people on the ground in these places. So uh, the war ends, and we get the Paris Peace Conference, uh, which Woodrow Wilson calls, we're going to have this big peace conference, and we're going to divide up the fate of the world, and everyone's going to listen to us, and we all know that none of that really happened. Right. Now, some of the Arab leaders actually went to the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, a man named Faisal, uh, Faisal, who was one of Sharif Hussein's sons, who had been hanging out in Damascus, actually went in a delegation to basically, he wanted to go to Wilson and say, we want an Arab state. And he went and Wilson wouldn't listen to him because it turned out that when Mil then Woodrow Wilson said, um, national self-determination, he really only meant national self-determination for white Europeans. He didn't mean it for Asians. He didn't mean it for Middle Easterners or Africans or anybody else. <laughs> so um, what ended up happening is in the Treaty of Versailles, they created uh, something called um, League of Nations Mandate. So they create this League of Nations and they have to decide what are we going to do with all the former colonial holdings of the countries that we defeated, especially mm. Germany, but, but others. And so they create something called mandates. Now, 
the mandate system was basically a way of saying these countries should probably become their own nations, but the people there aren't quite ready for self-governance. So we're going to have these other countries who are on the winning side hold the mandate and they're supposed to like help guide the people towards self-governance. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell. Yeah, that worked out well. So um, basically they had three classes of mandates, class A, class B, and class C. Class A mandates were European powers were given all administrative rights with the intention that these areas should become independent. And class A mandates were in Mesopotamia, Palestine, and Syria. And the way it worked out is that France received the mandate for Syria, Britain received the mandate for Mesopotamia, and for Palestine. And B and C mandates were in, uh, uh, mostly in um, Africa. And, um, but here's the problem. They had to hold another conference to really write a peace treaty for the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and at that peace treaty, basically the Ottoman Empire relinquished all of its colonial holdings. And it was reconstituted as the nation state of Turkey, just in the area that we know it today. And so the British were like, ooh, let's have another conference to figure out what we're going to do with all of our new mandate places. So they held something called the Cairo Conference. Now, things weren't going so well for the British. In the Middle East, there was a lot of fighting. Um, there had been this horrible flu. They lost a lot of people. And plus, their Arab allies were getting all antsy. Um, this guy who was one of Sharif Hussein's sons, remember he, had, he had three sons. He sent two of them with the British. One was Faisal. The other was Abdullah. Abdullah was hanging out like in what is now Jordan. And he was saying that he wanted to go attack Syria to help his brother Faisal, which would have been a huge problem because Syria, because France now had control of Syria. And so basically if Abdullah did that, he could start a war between Britain and France. Not good. So here's what Britain decided to do. They said, we're, we have, we're gonna split this Palestine mandate into two. We're gonna call one Transjordan and the other Palestine. And they used the Jordan River as the border. And so they said that in the Palestine mandate, they would make, they would adopt the Balfour Declaration. They were gonna keep the mandate for that, but they'd make it a Jewish national home. Then Transjordan was going to be, would still be under a British mandate, but they were gonna put Abdullah in control. So basically set him up as king. So this guy from Mecca, is now hanging out in Jordan and is the king of Jordan. And in fact, his family still rules. And that's one of the two countries today that are named after their family monarch. It's called the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and Abdullah is from the Hashemite line. And if you're not looking at a map, um, and I'm gonna try to pull up Google Earth to do it, Mecca to Jordan is a long, long way to go. It's not, it's not across, you know, across <laughs> the river or like a twin city type deal. See if I can measure it out here in miles on uh, Google Earth if it opens oh, up. Oh yeah. It's a long way. Oh, yeah. But Abdullah was satisfied. Unfortunately, things didn't go so well for the other brother, Faisal. He was in um, Syria. Remember, the French get Syria. And the French are like, we do things differently from the British. We do not want to set you up as a local ruler. We want to rule directly Syria. So basically, he ended up getting kicked out. And he runs to the British, and the British are like, yeah, we get, we screwed you over. Would you like to be king of Iraq? <laughs> yeah, we have this new country <laughs> that we started in this area we used to call Mesopotamia, and you can be our puppet in Iraq. And so that's where he went. And the French ended up dividing Syria into, they separated off the coastal area, which is Lebanon, basically because there are a lot of Christians on the coast of Lebanon, Maronite Christians, who are actually part of the Catholic uh, hierarchy. So the um, Maronite uh, patriarch is actually like a recognized somebody in the, I'm not totally familiar with all the Catholic lingo, but he is part of the, the Catholic church. They're, they're part of that. And so the French were very concerned with making sure that Christians were protected. So they took part, the coastal area where a lot of the Christians live, they added some more to it, which ended up bringing in a large minority of Muslims, but they called that Lebanon. 
and then they divided that off from Syria. And so that's how we got Lebanon, Syria, Jordan. It was at first Transjordan, but they later renamed it Jordan, Iraq, and then Palestine, which later becomes Israel. And you and you took you a day or two to learn all this, or a week. Or <laughs> you got so, um, if people are interested, uh, basically, I gave you the very um, brief and, and brief form of um, the story in this book called "A Peace to End All Peace," which is one of my favorite books about the forming of the Middle East. It's basically about the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the creation of of the Middle East by a man named David Frompkin. David Frompkin. Uh, he's now dead, but I had the opportunity, actually, I, I studied with him. He was a, a professor at Boston University, and uh, I actually took his, his class about this, uh, which was really interesting. He was a, a, a lawyer by training, but he spent a lot of time in the British archives learning about how how the, how this whole process happened. And um, and so his book is really fascinating. It's it's very, very accessible and as, as history books go. So uh, I definitely would recommend it if you're interested in, you know, more of the political machinations that went into all this. Okay. Meanwhile, but we never, we didn't get oh. to Saudi Arabia. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Yes. So, meanwhile, poor Sharif Hussein is hanging out in Mecca being like, what happened? I thought I was getting a state out of this. Uh, and he has sent a lot of his men and his sons out of Arabia. And guess who's been watching all this? Abdulaziz Ibn Saud, who has been using this time to expand his control uh, over Riyadh and over Central and Eastern Arabia. And he is basically starts this like march westward, conquers Mecca, kicks Sharif Hussein out and, and takes total control and ends up consolidating uh, his rule in uh, and establishes the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And so that's how we get Saudi Arabia. Now, the other Gulf states are, are kind of a, a bit of a mishmash um, because Kuwait was always a little sheikhdom and they actually asked the British to come in and be their kind of protectorate because they didn't have any military and they kind of asked the, the British to come and, and protect them and kind of keep them, uh, you know, from being gobbled up by mm -hmm. uh, what was going on. So, so that's how, how we got the British. Um, the country of Bahrain, which is this tiny island, had always kind of been separate. Um, it had done a lot of, did a lot of trade, particularly with with India and with the Portuguese. And so it was always kind of like a separate little like trading area. Um, and I didn't know that actually until I went to Bahrain and, and had the opportunity to learn a bit about Bahraini history, which is actually, you know, it's not, it's, it's actually quite different from everyone else in the Gulf. Interesting. Yeah, because they are, so, they are basically, it's like they're an island, right? They're just, they're, yeah, they're, they're a tiny, tiny island. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then you have, uh, well, depending on how you pronounce it, Qatar or Qatar or whatever. You yeah, Qatar. Yeah, I've heard a lot of different pronunciations. Um, so Qatar and, and the UAE, so the UAE was originally this thing called the, the Trucial States, mm -hmm. and um, they didn't become the United Arab Emirates until much, much later. Um, there was always, you know, there were just basically these, these various sheikhdoms, and it wasn't until... I think maybe the 60s that they actually kind of united together in this kind of confederation. But they're actually, uh, you know, the ones we know, we know Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Abu Dhabi is where the oil industry is. Mm -hmm. Dubai is where the big financial stuff is. But there are actually, you know, others. There's Ajman, there's Sharjah, um, you know, there's a bunch of other ones. There's um, this other one that I can't remember the name of, but I'm going to check on my map. Uh, Fujera, which is becoming a big uh, yeah, um, out there, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, shipping area and uh, area where um, they do a lot of oil storage. Um, and so, you know, they're kind of at the mercy, I think, of the, the richer ones, but uh, they're, all, they're all part and parcel. So Oman, we're, 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 as you we're, asked. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, will, I, I didn't want to get to that. But before you go further, if you look at this kind of the map here of the Persian Gulf, um, the, the Saudis obviously have a lot of beachfront property, if you will, but if you look at the, you know, the UAE, uh, kind of that area, that would actually be the pinch point where you'd want to control 
Um, did they never have interest in it because they had access on the other side of the ocean or why would, or was there a war or battle or anything fault for that, that, that piece of land um, from the Saudi standpoint? Because it would seem, again, going back a couple hundred years, that would be the, the you know, the, the, uh, the beachfront property you'd want to fight over. Yeah. So I think that, that at the time that they had, I think that maybe the, the idea to, to do it, they were, it wasn't quite the beachfront. There wasn't the strategic element that we see today, but um, there are a lot of uh, allegiances and alliances and, and kind of, um, uh, so I don't think it was really necessary for them to actually try to take it over. The biggest border dispute between Saudi Arabia and the UAE was always over the, you know, the line separating the two because there's a lot of oil there. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, so they've always... Yes, so that's that's really where they they were mostly fighting over the oil resources as opposed to, you know, the area controlling access to uh, to the Persian Gulf. And then the other Maybe one they should have. Well, right, but the other one you're about to get to is Oman and Yemen. Yemen obviously is the other pinch point on the other side. And now obviously the Saudis and uh, or and some I don't call it war, but there's a military uh, grievances to put it mildly. Yeah. So how did we get Yemen and Oman? So Yemen was always kind of its own independent kingdom. If you if you look at a, a topographical map, you'll see that the the territory of Yemen is actually very different from this territory in Saudi Arabia. Down there, there's a lot of it's basically desert, and then you get this mountain range. And Yemen is very mountainous. Uh, it gets more rain. There's more agriculture there. And there had always been independent kind of kings in Yemen. And they'd always been much more focused uh, and oriented towards Africa uh, and trade with Africa than they were towards the Middle East. So Yemen was always separate. Um, the biggest issue was that at a certain point, I believe in the 60s, um, there was kind of this like Marxist rebellion there and Yemen actually split into North Yemen and South Yemen. And the Saudis were on one side of that, the non-Marxist side. Uh, and that actually did impact Oman, which had also always been its own kingdom, its own sultanate. They actually call it the Sultanate of Oman. Um, and this was before the Kabus, who was the guy who just died, uh, became the sultan, but they, they, they were involved in this border dispute with Yemen when they were fighting this war. But um, in general, they were also um, quite kind of much more oriented towards trade with India. And uh, I know they, they for a long time controlled Zanzibar. Uh, and so they were much more kind of oriented in, in a different way and had many more uh, Portuguese influences as well because the Portuguese were big traders uh, in the area. Yeah, it's inter interesting as you pull up the, uh, the, the topographical map, I got the Google Earth open and looking at it, and it, it is different. You kind of have this big old, big old sand spot and then, you know, you get to, into Yemen, it's, you see some green. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot. Yeah, well, the rain basically like stops at the mountain. Yeah. The mountains kind of stop the yeah. rains. And so that's how it all goes in Yemen and none for the Saudi desert. Well, you know, just as an aside, I had on uh, the guy from Kenya's Red Cross yesterday. And he, he said that some of the locusts, they believe, come down from Yemen. Um, and so I don't know. Uh, I just found that interesting. I don't know much about where the locusts come or come, don't come, but that's come. Kind of, at least a fault or maybe prove in fact I have no idea but anyways so you you see we have it, it's it's just interesting because when you look at it you would think that the Saudis um, from the western perspective of the imperialists and the conquering like it would it would be surprising if we lived in a world today where Saudi Arabia controlled all of that land um, and in the spots that they don't are on some level at least militarily speaking or trade speaking strategic and they don't have those and so it's just kind of fascinating to go well why did they get those? Um, and and then your point about um, earlier was, uh, I, went, I went to circle back around to, is uh, Mecca seems, as you said, to kind of change the, the the power landscape for the Saudis, really kind of brought them into the, to the forefront. And that's still today, of course, they have the oil, but they also have Mecca, which helped me understand, is Mecca something that unites the Middle East or is it something that's very controversial about the Middle East, I know that you have the, the, the pilgrimage to Mecca and stuff like that. Is that a time where um, you see these nations kind of come together or is there strife? Because we haven't talked about, you know, the Saudis and Iran and stuff like that, but yeah. there is normal strife between them on a normal basis, but that kind of a, a de-escalation period. Yeah, I, I would say that Mecca is really like the religious heart of 
the Muslim world. So when I when I teach this, I often show several different maps, and they're all of the exact same area. But I'll show an, a map of the Arab world, a map of the Muslim world, and then a political map of the Middle East. And there are, and also and and those are all different because the Muslim world is much much larger than say just the Arabic speaking world, the Arab world, mm -hmm. and um, it's also much different from what we'd consider the, the the political boundaries of the Middle East. And because the, the Saudis have control over Mecca, they do have this kind of uh, control over this uniting force. And we've seen that, that even when relations between the Saudis and the Iranians are, are at their worst, um, you know, they've never actually excluded Iranians from Hajj. You know, they'll use it as a political kind of talking point or they'll, they'll threaten, you know, oh, we're going to reduce your visa quota for Hajj or mm -hmm. something like that. But in the end, they always come. And so it is something that unites, um, that does unite the Muslim world. One of the, the interesting things is actually back to the Ottoman Empire is when they started fighting uh, in, in World War I, the Ottoman Sultan actually called for a jihad against the British because his hope was that, you know, they, the Ottomans saw themselves as kind of the leaders of the Islamic world. And he said this because he wanted Muslims in India to rise up against the British. That was his goal. And so he called for this jihad and the Muslims in India were like, what? We don't listen to you. And actually a lot of, of Indians, Muslim and Hindu and, and other fought for the British on the side of the British against the Ottomans in World War I. So really the Ottomans kind of thought they had this religious power that they didn't. And it turned out that the Saudis in conquering Mecca were able to you know, harness that in some way, but it's never quite been the pol been able to translate it into political power because Sharif Hussein of Mecca also thought he had political power by controlling Mecca. He's like, I'm going to call for, the, and the British thought he did. The British thought he could lead an Arab wide revolt and he could call for it all he wanted, but nobody was listening to him. You know, nobody in, in Syria listened to his call or no one in, in Iraq did. They, he raised some armies that fought with the British and that's what made the difference, but it wasn't like a general revolt. So I think there's a religious and a cultural power, but that doesn't always translate into political or military unity. Okay. Now, I know we are up against time. Do you have a few more minutes or do you need to run? I don't want to keep... Oh, uh, we can do a few more minutes. Okay. Let's just do a few more minutes. Okay. So let's just kind of uh, get current really quick. So we kind of have the, the modern formation. When people turn on the news, they hear you know, Syria or Jordan or Iran or Iraq or Saudi Arabia, you, you're kind of saying that there's these differences. Just how should we think about this? Um, they, uh, a lot of these are member nations of OPEC. And so they do trade deals, they work together, but then they have these uh, differences, as you've mentioned. Um, is, is the tension more like a Republican and Democrat in the U.S., where it's a lot of high level, but on the ground, there's a lot of peace? Or is it really kind of all the way down to to the bottom and, uh, you know, kind of, kind of answer some of those questions. I think that there are a lot of, of, there are a lot of underlying tensions. Um, there are religious tensions, but religion isn't the be all and end all. There are cultural tensions. You know, there, there are a lot of different ethnicities in this area. We talked about, you know, Arabs, but even in Saudi Arabia, you've got, you know, the, the, the Hashemites and the Hashemite tribe and the Hashemite clan in that part of, of Arabia is totally different from the tribes, you know, the, the, the Saudi tribes and those in, uh, in Eastern Arabia. And there's still a lot of, of tribal tension. You've got the Kurds, which we didn't talk about at all, uh, which are a big ethnic group that spread in, you know, there are Kurds in Turkey, Kurds in Iraq, Kurds in Syria, Kurds in Iran. Uh, you know, there are Kur Kurds all over the place. And that's another element of tension. And so, uh, and then you've also got political ideologies overlaid with that. For a long time, um, Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was basically the dictator of Egypt, uh, tried to promote this idea of pan-Arabism, which was like all Arabs be united against the evil British colonialists, but really he meant, listen to me, I will tell you what to do. And there were a lot of Arabs like um, 
King Faisal in Saudi Arabia who didn't go with that, particularly because Pan-Arabism was by nature a very secular ideology and Faisal was, you know, not having that. So I think that, that um, you know, just like, you know, we talk about political parties in the United States, Republican versus Democrat, uh, and yet there are a lot of regional differences. So mm -hmm. a person who's in the Republican Party in Massachusetts looks very different from someone who's in the Republican Party, say, in Alabama. And, um, you know, and, and those, so, so on top of, you know, political and religious differences, you've got a lot of regional variations uh, and, and differences in, in ethnicity that come out when it's relevant. Yeah, and that's kind of, this is kind of maybe a, a good spot to kind of start wrapping things up on, because one of the things that you said, and, and I wanted, that I didn't expect you to say, but you said it kind of, uh, I thought about, you know, geopolitics, I love talking about and discussing, but the history on some level, you have to kind of have some understanding to kind of think about, you know, where these people came from and what they're doing and why they're doing it, because that does shape their worldview. Um, and one of the things that, that, if you go back in history long enough, you find that, you know, one nation fought another nation and one nation was taken over by another nation. But the more that you have the nations intertwined, it seems to be the harder it is to actually resolve problems. Um, and so it's hard enough for a nation to work together because we have, you know, Republicans and Democrats. But then when you have, you know, the British are backing the, uh, I think you said the Jordan and the France or in Syria or vice versa, and they want to attack or they won't do this, they can't because of this. And it seems like the, the Middle East is kind of a, a microcosm of, of kind of that is that you have not only these inter-religion, inter-political and inter-ethnicity and all these things that are kind of inside these borders, you also have these outside influences who are constantly putting different pressures and that makes it even harder for things to be resolved because there is no clear directive. Um, you cannot say that uh, Iraq wants this because Iraq has the U.S. and then they got Iran and it's so, so kind of maybe um, some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and that's been one of the, the big questions that's always been asked because the borders of the Middle East were drawn, the hard, fast, you know, national borders between nation states were drawn basically by the British and to some extent the French. And they don't really reflect a whole lot of uh, concern for ethnicities and, and things like that. You know, Iraq, why, why is Iraq separated from Turkey where it is? Uh, you know, we know kind of why Lebanon and Syria were divided the way they were, but, but you know, they made a lot of, of ethnic and, and national and even linguistic issues there. And so the question was really, well, can these people exist? Can they really become a nation state outside of British or French imperial rule? Once that rule is released, can they actually hold themselves together? Can they find something that unifies them as a nation? And, you know, there were a lot of people who argued for a while that, you know, Iraq should be divided up into, you know, four different states or, um, you know, Syria should be divided up and, and all these, these areas should be, you know, essentially could be divided into different states. And I think that gets to the, the fundamental question of what makes a nation state. And we've seen a lot of nation states that are made up of fundamentally different peoples. I mean, Belgium, for example, I mean, Spain, like these are old, what we would consider like old time nation states that still have a lot of ethnic tensions. And then, so the real question becomes, and, and this is a, a borrowed borrow term from a, a man named Benedict Anderson, who coined the term imagined community. Can they create an imagined community for themselves and have something that, that binds them together? And, uh, you know, I think we see this in various stages. So it's interesting if you look at Saudi Arabia right now and you look at a, a lot of the, they never really had a, a sense of a nation state. There was always this idea of, of allegiance to a king and religion. And recently in the past couple of years, we've seen a real effort on the part of the government to inculcate a, a, a national, a, a sense of, of a nationhood and national pride that exists outside of the religion and outside of a tribal affiliation. And I think the question is, can that become successful? And, you know, can Iraq develop a sense of, of a nation, of a United Nation state, if it is still divided into the Kurdish autonomous area and the Shiite areas and the Sunni areas? And, and so we, and, and I think, 
you know, the jury's still out on that. Yeah, the British created these borders and it's really hard to change borders and maybe it's better to just go with it and try to cr see if these people can, can latch on to some sort of shared history, shared identity, form, in fact, a new identity. And, and that process is sometimes violent and yeah. messy. Yeah, I agree. And now I have said, I think I don't know if I've said it in the newsletter that uh, during the Obama administration, nothing to do with Obama per se, but I, I theorize that the large nation states would struggle because you're now seeing um, diversity of opinion and thought, whether it's in the U.S. or um, you know, wherever. Um, and you're seeing that today play out with, you know, China and Hong Kong or, you know, insert, insert area here. <laughs> you know, there's, and so the large nation state model, um, we, I think on some level, we want to preserve it it has benefits, obviously, uh, but you also, as you mentioned, to to tear it apart usually means a bloody, terrible people die war, and so it's 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 kind of the argument as well. It's better to preserve it, um, but I think globally there there's more likely than not a conversation can be had about what, why are we doing what we're doing this way today. We have WhatsApp, we have Bitcoin, we have gold, we have, you know, you can get wherever you want to, um, whereas in 1427, you had to get on a ship and take, you know, so life is changing. And um, while I'm not necessarily advocating revolutions or, uh, you know, uh, vast changes overnight, I do think it, it, it would be interesting to track the next few years uh, or decade or so, you know, how these nation states exist, can they coexist, can they unify? Because um, to your point, uh, to unify around, if you just say America, and because I'm not familiar with the, with the Middle East like you are, we've kind of unified around, well, we're Americans, but now as we're seeing today and over the past you know, four years, at least, and even longer, well, what does that actually mean to be American? You know, and there's a lot of debates about what an American is and what's a good American, what's a bad American. Um, and we kind of had that strong rallying cry for a long period of time. And now it's being challenged. I can imagine if you're in a spot to where that was never really um, something you had that would be, it would be harder to formulate that now than uh, because you could look around and say, well, actually, if I just cross over this imaginary border and go live in this state, uh, nation state, then I, that's what I want, you know? And so I wonder if we'll see maybe um, immigration thought of differently or, um, or citizenship thought of differently. Again, not overnight, but just, I, just things I've thought about before because we are at a spot now where you can hear, oh, wow, okay. I'm a Marxist and man, there's a, there's a country full of Marxists over there and I want to go be with those people, you know? Um, so anyways, just curious your thoughts on that. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm off my rocker, but I do think it's at least a conversation that might be had and I don't want war or blood or any of that to be spilled. I just, yeah. this feels like um, there is a lot of this kind of sentiment going around um, globally, not just here or there. Or, uh, anyways, but. Absolutely. And I think that the, um, the fall in some respects of some of the very authoritarian leaders and the dissemination of technologies that make information sharing easier um, have made have brought these kinds of debates and issues to the forefront definitely in the Middle East you know if you look back you know when Iraq was under the control of Saddam Hussein everything was very tightly controlled and there was no real possibility for dissent uh, the same with Assad's Syria, and uh, even even with with Saudi Arabia, you know you have to be be very careful with what you say there, especially because they are very they have become very adept at monitoring what people say on these uh, you know internet channels. But at the same time, like uh, I, I speak about Saudi Arabia because I happen to to know the most about it. In the, the internet is not restricted. I mean, it's restricted in that they might come after you for saying the wrong thing on Twitter, but it's not like Iran where they can't actually get on Twitter they, or, or, you know, where actual websites are blocked. Like, it's not blocked in Saudi Arabia. You can go learn about anything. And that's a very different thing than we saw from, say, the Soviet Union, which was very much a, a closed loop uh, authoritarian system. And so the fact that a lot of these, e e that either the authoritarian systems have come down or that there are these incredible holes in them that enable people to get around and be exposed to different ideas and information and, and other societies and, and other ideas about governing, I think has led to uh, and maybe really sped up a lot of the, the change and the ways that people are conceiving of, you know, their, their nation statehood. Okay. All right, Ms. Wald. I know we are past time. I appreciate the extra minutes. Saudi Inc. is the book. So be sure if you haven't read that, um, she covers Saudi Arabia. I just wanted to kind of a um, more 
wider talk for today. It's so much and so much history there. And it's, it's, it's all fascinating. And the fact that you, <laughs> you have it all uh, uh, memorized for uh, or, or large portions. To, of it to be something. fair, I was looking at notes. Well, yeah, so okay. I, I did have my notes in front of me. <laughs> you have your notes in front of you, but, but it wasn't like you needed your notes um, as much as I would have needed literally <laughs> word on the page so uh, thank you miss wald and we will be back on energy week you also write for forbes and bloomberg com, bloomberg uh, also um you know follow me on twitter my uh twitter handle is at energized economy that's uh e n sorry I'm, i want to make sure i spell it right <laughs> on my own twitter name right e n e r g z d economy and uh, also, if anyone's interested in like more reading about any of this, hit me up and I will uh, be happy to recommend some interesting books. And we'll, we will link to a piece to end all piece as well. So folks, cool. want to check that out. All right, Ms. Walt, thank you so much. Listeners, we'll be back tomorrow with another episode and uh, talk to you then. Bye. <laughs>